here this morning. Amen. Thank the Lord for the children. People have some, some people have a problem with the children. When you really have a problem is when you don't have any children. We go some places and it's that way. So thank God for all of them. Amen. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Remember the pastor, he and Miss Angela are in Virginia. He's preaching a homecoming service. He will be back tonight, Lord willing. So thank the Lord. If you don't thank the Lord now, you wait like I get done preaching. You'll thank the Lord for him tonight. <laughs> Amen. Turn to Luke chapter 23 this morning. I'm so glad that Jesus don't need nothing from yeah. me to save me. Amen. That's a blessing, ain't it? Yeah, amen. He don't need a thing in this world from you for you to do anything to save you except believe yeah. on him. That's it. Amen. That's it. You know, people, uh, we, got our, we got our mindset wrong, right? Uh, yeah. Heard a while back, I never thought about it. Abraham went to offer Isaac. And it was a, he encountered that God was able to raise him from the dead. That's what the Bible says. You compare the book of John, the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, he encountered that he was able to raise him from the dead. He didn't understand everything was going on, but he was going to sacrifice him. But it was more than that. He was going to burn him up. Yeah, right. He wasn't going to leave God anything to work with. Yeah. You know, we don't think like that. Uh, many times uh, lost people... If I can just give God something to work with, I'll come to him. He'll say, uh, if I put this bottle down, I'll come to him then. Right, right. And he'll say, uh, if I can leave these pills alone, I'll come to him then and I'll let him say. Right. Uh, we'll get married one day, right? We're, we're, we're cohabitating. So, so, so one day we'll get married and get that right. And then I'll come to Jesus and let him save me. He doesn't need anything you can do. Any deeds you can do, any good thing you can do, he needs nothing to save your soul. He needs you to believe on him and call on him, and he will save your soul right now. Not at the altar call. I'm talking about right now. You may be at home right now if you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and believe on him. The Bible says you shall be saved. Uh, that's what kind of God we have. That's what kind of Savior we have. That's what kind of salvation we have. He doesn't need anything from you to save you. He's enough. Yeah. What he did was enough. His blood is enough. His power is enough to save whosoever will, the Bible says. Amen. Man, that's a blessing. Man. Uh, we can pray go home right now, and I think we'll be all right. It's a blessing. We ain't going to do that, though. <laughs> Y'all got out in Sunday school. Y'all ain't getting out in the preaching. Uh, turn, we're in Luke chapter 23. Look in verse number 39 is where we're going to start. Luke 23, verse number 39. The Bible says that one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly? For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man, speaking of Jesus, hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Uh, the title of the message this morning is Hard Man, Humble Man, and Holy Man. Uh, brother Tracy, you pray for us, brother. Amen. 
Uh, we see here three men. One in the middle, we know, is Jesus Christ. The Bible says the malefactors or thieves were hung on either side of him. So we know of that hard man and humble man and holy man, we know the holy man represents Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Uh, he is God. He always has been God. Uh, before he came to earth, he was God. When he was on earth, he was God. He's in heaven now. He's God. And he forevermore will be a holy God. He is the second person of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. So that is the holy man, the holy man. But these other two, this hard man and this humble man, you know who that is? That's you and I. One of them is us. Uh, we will be hard or we will be humble. Just like these two men. One of them was hardened. He rejected Jesus Christ. He died and he went to hell. Uh, hell's a real place. Hell's a horrible place. God didn't want anyone to go to hell. He wants all people to be saved. John Calvin's a wrong. John Calvin's a liar. Uh, the Bible says, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So that hard man rejected Jesus Christ with that humble man, that humble thief. He received Jesus Christ. He was saved in the Old Testament sense of the word. And heaven's going to be his home according to what Jesus said. Uh, if that man didn't make it to heaven, then Jesus was wrong. As he said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. All the earth after resurrection, he led captivity captive. So this man, this humble man, as we sit here today, He's in heaven, yeah. and that hard man, as we sit here today, is on fire. Yeah. And has been for 2,000 years and will yeah. remain forever so. Yeah. So I want to look at the two men. Let's just look at them a little bit, each one of them. Uh, in our story here, one of them is he's rebuking Jesus and throwing things back in his face, but the other one's humble. He's humbled down. He believes in Jesus and he turns to him. But let's look at the two men. The Bible says right here in verse number 39 that they were, they were malefactors. They were criminals. That's what the word malefactor is. They were, they were criminals. They had been convicted of a crime found to be guilty. Oh, uh, That's the problem with people. We don't look at our sins the same way we look at other people's sins. Uh, we were, I was watching a western the other night and there was three criminals locked up chained to a wagon. And one of them looked at the other two and said, y'all criminals, shut up. Now he was chained up with them. But in his mind, he wasn't a criminal like they were. That's the way people are, right? Other people's sins are very grievous. And we can spot them quick, but our own sins, you know what? We have an excuse, we have a reason, and they're just not quite as bad as other people's sins. Uh, so they were malefactors. Turn to Matthew 27. Hold your place here. We're going to spend some time right here. But turn to Matthew chapter 27. This crucifixion account is given in each gospel, and we know when we study each account, in the Gospels, we get a little more information. We get a more complete picture of what happened. Look at Matthew 27. Look at verse number 38. Matthew 27 and 38, the Bible says, Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the left, one on the right. So they were malefactors. They were criminals. And the Bible tells us that the crime that they were guilty of, convicted of, was thievery. I have a problem with a thief. Uh, you know, you work hard for something and try to get some people steal. And, and the Bible even makes a provision for stealing food. The Bible might, it, it's not right. But still, I have a problem with the thieves. So these yeah. men were malefactors, they were criminals, and they were thieves. Right. 
uh, taking something from someone else that didn't belong to it and the people had worked hard for. They were thieves. And not only that, look here in verse number 39. The Bible says, And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. This is Jesus they're reviling. And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and build it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. So these people are mocking Jesus and laughing at him. But look at verse 44. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. They were malefactors. They were criminals. And these dudes were mean. There they are themselves nailed to a cross through their hands and through their feet and they're taking time to mock and to curse Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God. So that's these two men. They're malefactors, they're thieves, and they're mean. Now the Bible tells us in the book of Mark that about the third hour is when they crucified Jesus and these men. Now uh, Mark is the gospel of the servant. That's the way it pictures Jesus Christ. And the timelines in Mark are clearer and in chronological order better than the other three gospels. Uh, that last week of Jesus Christ is clear and precise to timeline the Chronicles. So the book of Mark tells us that they were crucified about the third hour. And after that thief called on Jesus Christ to remember, the Bible says it was the sixth hour. Now this thief right here, verse 44, said the thieves also. So both of them were cast in this into Jesus' face. Yeah. But somewhere, something in that three-hour period from the third hour to the sixth hour, something happened to that one thief. Uh, something happened to that one thief and he repented and realized who he was and realized who Jesus Christ was and he called on him to remember him when he came into his kingdom. Uh, he went from mocking Christ to professing him as a savior. He went from being a hard man to being a humble man. Right. Well, how did he profess him to be a savior? All he said was, remember me when thou comest into my kingdom. Uh, he had heard Jesus preach, obviously heard Jesus teach about the kingdom that was to come. It was going to be his kingdom. And this man hanging on this cross, when he asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom, knew it had to be in the future because he knew there wasn't anybody coming down off that cross alive. They were all going to die on that cross. He believed in the resurrection and the coming kingdom. That's the Old Testament salvation. That's all the man had to work with, and he believed on Jesus Christ. Now this other thief, he never changed his mind. Turn back to Luke Chapter 23. Look at Luke chapter 23. Look at verse 39 again. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. He never changed his mind. In that same time period, whatever took place, that changed the one thief's heart and made him repent and made him realize who he was, made him realize who Jesus was. That same time period, it affected this other man in the other way. He was just as hard, if not harder, than he was before. He was hard towards Christ. Uh, the cross of Jesus Christ is an offense. That's what the Bible calls it. It is offensive. The cross, every person, every person will either be drawn to the cross yeah, right. or be repulsed by the cross. Yeah. 
That cross will draw me into it and women and children or it will harden people and make them turn their back. And you know people that's like that seem like the older they get and the more they get in sin and the more they're witness to and the right. more God deals with the heart, they get harder and harder yeah. and harder. And you see some people, life comes in and life starts happening and the Holy Spirit deals with people. You can see them humming their self down and humming their self down and a proud man or a proud woman will humble himself down and come to Jesus Christ and be saved and get their heart right. That's the way the cross works. Nothing in this world is as despised as the cross of Calvary. Uh. This man here, in verse 39, he was hard and selfish right up to the end. Best we can tell, we have no account in the Bible of this hard man, this hard thief, ever repenting and ever confessing and ever returning to Jesus Christ. No account of it. This man was hard and he was selfish to the very end. So this cross, it drew one man and humbled one man down and it repulsed the other man. This man in the middle, this cross of Jesus Christ, why is the cross so offensive? Why is it so offensive? Uh, you know what the Bible is? It's light. You know what the light does? The light reveals things. Uh, we like the, John chapter 3, uh, we like our deeds in the dark. Uh, we like to have them. We like to separate the things that people know of us that are in the light and the things that are dark. Man likes it that way. But this book, this Bible, this cross illuminates. It brings light. It reveals what mankind is. It reveals what God is. Why is the cross so offensive? Look here in verse number 40. We're in Luke 23. Look at verse number 40. The Bible says, But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same <coughs> condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. You know why the cross is so offensive? Because it reveals to us that that's exactly what we deserve. Yeah. That's it. This cross that Jesus Christ hung on, he did nothing to deserve it. You and I, every man, woman, or child that's ever been born, they deserve this cross, this punishment. Now hold your place here and turn to Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter 3. Look at verse number 23. Look, look at me and let's see what it says. Romans 3 and verse number 23. The Bible says in Romans 3 and 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So according to the Bible, all people have sinned. Uh, if you believe that, give me an amen. amen. I think. Even some that don't even amen say they said amen that time. Uh, it's a fact. So we've established a fact that every person, every woman, every child has sinned. We just established that fact before God. Now turn to Romans chapter number six. Romans chapter number six. Look in verse number 23. So we've established the fact that everyone has sinned. Romans 6 and 23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. Because of this sin, we deserve to die. But I thank God the verse didn't end there. Oh, I thank God that that semicolon is not the end of the verse. Uh, the verse goes on to say, but the gift of God yeah. is eternal life Thank through God. Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thank God 
that we can have eternal life and it is a gift and we can have it because Jesus Christ, Amen. the sinless Son of God, was willing to hang on that cross and shed his blood yeah. and give his life. Amen. And if we will take our little bit of faith and place it in that, he'll give us the faith to be saved and we can have eternal life and be eternally secure in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, the cross is so despised because we deserve it. We deserve to die and hang and die on that cross. And you know what? People hate that fact. We don't want to think of ourselves in those terms. We want to think of ourselves in being good folks and being neighborly and helping the old lady across the street and uh, feeding the stray dog that comes around. Turn back to Luke chapter 23. Why is the cross so offensive? First, because we deserve it. And secondly, look in verse number 41. Luke 23 and 41. The Bible says, and we indeed justly, what the thief said, he said, we're getting this justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing Amiss. You know why the cross is so offensive? Because Jesus Christ hung on that cross and took that cross for each one of us. Yeah, right. We deserved it, but Christ took our place. Yeah, right. uh, it's called substitutionary atonement. That's a big old word, ain't it? Uh, you know what that means? That means that he, Jesus Christ, was our substitute. In our place. We know what that is. When we were in school, when the teacher was in there, we'd act like we had some sense because she'd smack us upside our head when I was coming through. But you let that substitute come in, and it was field day, son. It was a person coming in, taking that teacher's place. Jesus Christ took that cross for us. It was not his sin that hung him on that cross because he had none. It was mine and your sin. And he hung on that cross and he shed his blood and died to pay our sin debt, each person's sin debt. Say, well, preacher, I don't know that I'm that bad. That's the problem. You don't see yourself as that bad. You don't see yourself and your sin as bad enough for men to have to be whipped and scourged and nailed through his hands and his feet, a sinless man to pay your debt. Yeah. Why is the cross so, so offensive? Look at verse number 39 again. The Bible says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged read on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. You know why the cross is so offensive? It's the only way any person can be saved and make heaven their home. That's why it's so, off so offensive. People want it to be their way. Surely there's got to be something else I can do that God will accept. Everyone must come by the way of the cross. The Bible says in Colossians 1 and 20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross to reconcile all things unto himself. You, me, anyone you know, the good, bad, and the ugly, they cannot be reconciled to God apart from coming the way of the cross. That's the only sacrifice that God will accept not your good works, not your good deeds, not your membership, not anything you can do will God accept. The only thing he will accept is the precious blood of his son, Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. And this is how it works. This is exactly how it works. Someone is going to pay on that cross. You can spend a person that dies without Jesus Christ is going to spend an eternity in hell paying a sin debt that they can never pay. It will never end. Either you're going to pay it 
or you're going to accept the fact that Jesus Christ paid it. Someone's going to pay the debt. No other form of payment will be accepted. Y'all ever see that anywhere? Forms of payment accepted. It's about to get where you can't whip no cash out on nobody. They'll look at you like you got two heads. Where'd that come from? No other form of payment will be accepted besides the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's why that cross is so offensive. So we've established the fact both these men, they were mean. They were a bunch of no good thieves. They were convicted. They were criminals. They were malefactors. And, and in the book of Matthew, they were both of them were throwing those things in the teeth of Jesus Christ. The same thing the Pharisees and the scribes said. But something happened in that three-hour period that turned one of these men's heart. Well, what happened? I don't know. I wasn't expecting that, was you? I was on the edge of your seat. Thought she was going to get some inside information. Uh, I don't know. What would happen? That would cause one man to harden himself and cause another man to humble himself. Uh, I don't know. Kind of. I know what happened. Jesus Christ happened. I know that. Uh, I may not know all the specifics, but I know Jesus Christ happened. He was in the middle and he was nailed there and that one thief was on one side and the one thief was on the other side and they were looking and they were watching him and they were listening to seven sayings on the cross. They were listening to the things he said and sometime in there it drove one of them away. He got offended and it drew one of them to him and one of them's in hell, one of them's in heaven. That's how salvation works. Uh, What was it? Uh, Maybe it was uh, Luke 23, 33. Look here in verse 33 with me. Same chapter. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, where they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Maybe it was that. Maybe it's the fact that they're nailed to a cross and I can't imagine the excruciating pain that Christ and these two men, they were going through the exact same thing he was. Now, they deserved it, but it was still the same situation, same night, they were nailed up there with him. And I can't imagine the thoughts that were going through their mind, but I know the thoughts that that was going through Jesus' mind. For God, Father... Those men that are doing this to me, please forgive them. I'll guarantee you that wasn't on those two thieves' mind. And one of them, I'm sure he thought, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But it touched one of them, didn't it? Maybe it was the fact of Jesus Christ wanting forgiveness for these men that were punishing him unjustly. Maybe it was that. I don't know. Uh, Turn to John chapter 19. Turn to John chapter number 19. The crucifixion account in the gospel according to John. Look at John chapter 19. Look at verse number 25. Bible says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, And his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, John, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Maybe it was the fact of the concern that Jesus Christ had for his mother. Uh, in that time when he was nailed to that cross in excruciating pain and paying the sin debt for the sins of the world, maybe what took, touched that man's heart was the concern to the very end 
that Jesus had for everyone else, but not himself. Uh, whatever it was, one got harder and one humbled himself. Coming to Christ, uh, we make it out to be such an ordeal. We make it out to be so complicated uh, you want something simple, complicated, you get a bunch of men involved in it. And the women said, amen. Uh, you want something even more complicated than simple, you get a bunch of women involved in it. The men said, amen. Amen. Uh, we make coming to Christ so complicated. Let's talk about coming to Jesus Christ. For just a few minutes. Uh, you know one thing about coming to Christ? It is so simple. Yeah, you're right. God made it so simple that a little child can do it. Uh, we had a child get saved at youth camp a couple weeks ago. Well, that ain't the church. Uh, we had a girl get saved at home after youth camp. Yeah, right. Well, that ain't the church. Hallelujah. Yes. Uh, I like the church. Yeah. I like seeing people saved at the church. Right. I like to see people get saved anywhere. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, down at the Walmart, down at the lake, yeah. not on Sunday necessarily. I, I hope somebody gets saved there today, but you know what I mean. Right. I like to see people get saved anywhere. It is so yeah. Simple, but we make it so difficult. Right. This thief, who just a couple of hours early was mocking Jesus Christ, turned to him and said, Lord, I know you don't deserve what you're getting. You're sinless. Remember me when you come into my kingdom. So in a matter of hours, this man went from being a hardened, criminal, thief, mean man, to save by the grace of God is yeah, what he did. Right. Uh, what about repentance? I believe in repentance. What about old-fashioned conviction? Yeah, that's missing nowadays. Yeah, right. uh, what about mourning over our sinfulness? We should mourn over sinfulness. What about the old saints that you read about they went out in the woods and walled around for three months and starved themselves to death. You know why that takes place so many times? Because we're so hard-headed and we're so hard-headed we won't take God at his word for what he said that if you'll believe on Jesus Christ you shall be saved. I'm not trusting any thing else, not my works, not the church, not the water. I'm not trusting anything but you, Jesus Christ, save my soul. That's what salvation is, and it's not complicated. It's just not. Uh, this man started out that way, but some nails through your hands and your feet, that'll knock some of that stubbornness out of you. People wonder, why did this thing come into my life? Why is this happening this way? This is a bad situation. This is wrong. Why is this happening? Maybe it's God allowing things to come into your life to knock some of that stubbornness out of your head and out of your heart that you might turn to him and be saved or get right or whatever it is you have need of. Amen. It's simple. Not only that, coming to Christ there is no wrong time. Yeah, right. Well, I wish that girl got saved at church. You've lost your mind. She might not have made it back to church. Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That's what he said. He said, if any man will come to me, I will in no wise cast him out. He didn't put a place stipulation. Right. He didn't put a time stipulation. Right. 
Jesus Christ and this thief were both hanging on this cross, nailed through their hands, nailed through their feet. My way I understand you almost suffocate to death. They're hanging there, and that man takes that time to turn to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me. Jesus didn't say, don't you see what's going on? Why didn't you come to me yesterday? Why didn't you come to me six months ago? He didn't say that, did he? Jesus looked directly at that man and said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. There is no wrong time to come to Jesus Christ. Uh, the danger in putting it off. There may be someone sitting here right now and I know because I've done it and God's dealing with your heart right now and he's squeezing your heart and you're trying to get your mind off of it. And you're trying to bring things up in your mind that'll dry those tears up that's welling up in your eyes. Or you're trying to bring things up that'll happen and hurtful things people have done to you. So that way, when this altar call takes place and God's dealing with your heart, you can just beat that down and dry those tears up. You can just hang on where you don't have to go do what you know you need to do. It's the Holy Ghost drawing you. Another thing about finding some way to fight it off and put it off is that that just makes it a little bit easier next time. If you get through it this time, this morning, 12 o'clock day, if you can get through it right now, next time, it'll be a little bit easier. That's the hardening. That's why this one thief received Jesus Christ and the other rejected him. He got harder and harder and harder. If you just hang on through this one, it'll be easier next time. And if you're not careful, you're going to easy yourself right into a devil's hell. That's not what Christ wants. It's simple. There is no wrong time. And listen to me. There is no excuse for turning Christ away. There is none. Uh, bad things happen to good people. But listen to me. It's not Christ's fault. You read about things and hear about things and know things that have happened to people and you think, Lord, help. Why would something like that happen? How are these people going to go on? Listen to me. It's not Christ's fault. Evil men are going to grow worse and worse. There's evil in this world. This hard man here, he started off blaming Christ and everyone else for his situation. And the more it went on, the more he blamed everyone else and blamed Christ. And he wound up, best we know, dying on that cross and lifting up his eyes. He was in hell. Uh, it's not Christ's fault. The things that have happened to you, the things that have gone wrong, the bad things that people have done throughout your life, it's not Christ's fault. You know, the only thing Jesus Christ has ever done is love you. That's the only thing Jesus Christ has ever done for you is love you through your sins and your wrongs and your ups and your downs and your deeds done wrong and the things that you've done that you yourself to other people that you can't hardly, hardly live with yourself and yet through it all, all Christ has ever done is love you. Amen. That's it. He loved you enough to die for you. He loved you enough to take your place on that cross. You know who that should have been hanging on that middle cross? It should have been you. Yeah, right. And it should have been I. Yeah, right. It should have been us. But it was Jesus Christ and he did it and he shed his blood and he gave his life that the Bible says, whosoever will believe in him shall be saved and it won't be eternal death, it'll be eternal life. Yeah.
Oh, they don't know nobody love me. I'm not throwing rocks at you. Because sometimes in our own mind and our own hearts, we get to feeling like that. And you know what? Sometimes we actually believe that. Amen. But that's a lot of devils what that is. Amen. Jesus Christ loved you enough. <laughs> that man died for you. As wicked as y'all. We're here this morning. Uh, I'm not asking you to get baptized. Yeah. Just not. Uh, not asking you to join a church. Not. Uh, not asking you to come down and be a part of what we're doing. You're welcome to come down and be a part of what we're doing. But that's not what I'm asking you this morning. What I'm asking you is to believe on Jesus Christ and receive Jesus Christ so that heaven will be your eternal home and not hell. Hard man or the humble man? Which one are you? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you need to come this morning. Maybe you realize I am tired of putting this off. I need to be saved. I need to be born again. He's a call away. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want you to make that decision today. I want you to come to him as he's drawing. There's no wrong time. There's no wrong place. There's no wrong way. If you come to him with a true heart, he'll receive you. Or maybe you're saved this morning and just got things going on in your life and my life's turned upside down, preacher. I don't believe like I used to. I don't think like I used to. All the things I used to believe were facts. They're just muddled up in my mind. Won't you come to Christ this morning? He's the one that can straighten those things out. Won't you come this morning? People are praying. You come here, receive you. Won't you come this morning? Well, amen. I hope you can leave with peace in your heart this morning. Stand to your feet if you would. Got a couple of announcements as we stand. Uh, remember Brother Ben and Miss Jean's daughter, Wendy. She's having some fight some health issues. Uh, remember Miss West and Miss Crystal, they're both sick. Uh, out here on this bench, we have some shirts. They are free. Hey, good ones too, man. Yeah. Belt shirts, amen. And uh, also, if you want a camp t-shirt, there's a sign-up list on the outside. We did an Abraham thing. We started off with 10 and went to 8. Now it's whosoever will. But if you want a camp t-shirt, sign up, give them your name and your size. And also, there's dinner on the grounds today. 
So stay and eat some dinner on the ground. Not on the ground, but on the grounds. Uh. So remember the pastor and Miss Angela, they'll be traveling, coming in. Remember we're having the show tonight. I think we're going to get that worked out one way or another. Y'all be praying about that. We got some connection issues, but we'll get it worked out, so we're going to have that. Anything else before we close out in prayer? Amen. Brother Terry, would you close us in prayer?